Welcome to the Aerospace Advantage podcast. I'm your host, John Slickbaum. Here on the Aerospace Advantage, we speak with leaders in the DoD, industry, and other subject matter experts to explore the intersection of strategy, operational concepts, technology, and policy when it comes to air and space power. So if you like learning about aerospace power, you are in the right place. To our regular listeners, welcome back. And if it's your first time here, thank you so much for joining us. As a reminder, if you like what you're hearing today, do us a favor and follow our show. Please give us a like and leave a comment so that we can keep charting the trajectories that matter to you most. The U.S. and a lot of countries around the world are in the middle of rebuilding their air forces. Bottom line, with China pressing hard in the Pacific, Russia actively fighting in Ukraine, plus Iran and North Korea majorly in play, countries recognize that they can't take national security for granted anymore. It is time to modernize. And given that the U.S. Air Force and our allies largely still fly and fight with aircraft developed, built, and fielded in the Cold War, the need for this modernization is acute. Not only are these planes physically exhausted, but they simply don't have the attributes required to fight effectively and get home safe. And that's why we're seeing a record number of orders for aircraft like the F-35, B-21, Raphael, MQ-9B, E-7, the multi-role tanker transport, KC-46, F-16, and a whole lot more. This change of events contrasts sharply with what we've been watching for the past three decades, when combat aircraft production lines struggled to keep up amidst a weak order book. Just look at the F-22, B-2, and C-17. We shuttered those lines at a fraction of what they could have and should have produced because national leaders simply were not prioritizing air power. The same held true abroad with our allies. Commercial aerospace was far more robust in the 1990s, 2000s, and 2010s with a strong order book resetting airline fleets around the globe. Then came events like 737 MAX grounding, COVID, and the global lockdown, which saw the bottom fall out of commercial aviation. Now airline and military orders are surging and industry is struggling to meet demand. Everyone wants new aircraft now, but manufacturing lines can only accommodate so much so fast, especially on the defense side, which is optimized for low-rate, low-volume production. Folks are trying to expand this pipeline, but it's far easier said than done. So that's the focus of this week's episode. We are talking about the folks who literally build the future of air power, the defense industrial base, and learn more about how they view these dynamics, plus get their inputs on how we can ensure production supply can better meet demand. Now, you normally hear about prime companies like Lockheed Martin, Boeing, and Northrop Grumman, and they're really important, but they are only one part of the equation. What we want to focus on today, however, are the companies that build most of the content that a prime manufacturer assembles into what we would recognize as a finished airplane. It's easy to take these firms for granted because they tend to be less visible from an outward-facing perspective, but trust me, they are crucial. We call them suppliers. You can't build an airplane without them, and we can't increase production unless the supplier base is healthy. So the goal of today's episode is to better understand these companies, how they contribute, their strengths, and the risks that are in play. It is clear that we need to produce more aircraft. Our adversaries are not letting up, so we need to better understand what it will take to ensure that we have an industrial base that can make it happen. So to help us explore this topic, we have Richard Abulafia with us today, and he's a longtime friend of the Mitchell Institute and one of the most knowledgeable aerospace industry analysts in the business. And he's currently serving as the managing director at Aerodynamic Advisory, and that is an aerospace defense management consultancy headquartered in Ann Arbor, Michigan. So Richard, always a pleasure to have you with us. Oh, great to be on. Thanks so much for doing this. Well, thank you for being here. And we also have Carl Hutter. He is the president and CEO from ClickBond, and he's going to help give us a first-person supplier perspective. And they design and manufacture fasteners used throughout the aerospace sector. So they're literally the key holding airplanes together. So Carl, welcome to the Aerospace Advantage. Thanks so much, Slick. Great to be here and uh, help holding it together with you. Well, Richard, you know, and I do appreciate the pun there, Carl, but Richard, you know, I tried to paint the picture for the overreaching aircraft production challenges that we're seeing right now, but you are the expert. So what did I miss? And how did the weak order books of the 1990s and 2000s, plus the corresponding industry consolidation really change the ecosystem for suppliers? And 
I'm going to have you unpack a lot here, but you know, how do you explain the current surge in demand across commercial and defense? Because I know you have experience in, in both of the sectors. And you know, what does this really mean for us to, you know, from a production enterprise that's really just stretched so thin and try to meet its books? Yeah, boy, there's a lot to unpack there. Absolutely. You know, I, I think, you know, start from the, the 50 mile high view satellite, you know, Mohammed El Arian, the, I believe the chief economist at Allianz put it best. He wrote a rather influential piece in foreign affairs back about a year ago saying, you know, for basically since World War II, the defining condition of the world economy has been inadequate demand, those waning order books you talk about. This is the first time in, you know, that 70, 80 years, whatever it's been, that the problem is really inadequate supply. And that's true for most sectors of the economy, but no, no more so than aerospace and defense. And what was already a bad situation in terms of meeting demand got much worse, both with the pickup in tensions in the Western Pacific and then worse by Russia's Ukraine invasion. And now we have the horrific events of the attack by Hamas. The, everyone needs military equipment and lots of it. And of course, we have a defense industrial base that was sized for you know, the post-Cold War. Uh, it's really tough to come back from that tremendous exercise in downsizing. I think we, some of us <laughs> remember, some of us old enough remember those days, the Last Supper and all those other things. And, you know, we didn't think the requirement to snap back would be all that quick. We thought it would be gradual if it happened at all. You know, there were people who said, well, it's the end of history and the last man, liberal democracy and, and market economy, they won, no problem, end of history, have a nice day. And of course, the history has come back with a vengeance. And to put it colloquially, uh, Vladimir Putin has become the best F-35 salesman ever. And that's the only way to, to fathom it. The F-35 is kind of an interesting kind of a canary in the coal mine. It was the first program to really have trouble keeping up with incredibly strong demand. And at first we said, well, there are worse problems to have. But now, of course, everyone is having a really hard time meeting demand. Yeah, I, I could not agree with you more on, on many of the points that you made and really appreciate the context. Can, can we zoom out just for a second from a macro level just to help the audience understand why suppliers are so important and, and really what their role is? Well, you know, there's the old joke, how many parts are needed to make a plane? All of them. I mean, if a prime adds value for 15 or 20 percent of an aircraft, that's about typical. The other 80 percent or more comes from suppliers. And even within those systems, <laughs> they all have suppliers down to the third and fourth tier and all the way down to raw materials. The root of all of this, of course, is labor. And we've got a really stretched labor force. That's what happens when unemployment is, is 3.6. You know, that, that shouldn't be normal in an economy. And you get these folks who are like, well, that's just what they tell you at 3.6. My answer is, oh, so there are more workers? Please, where do we find them? We need them. Help. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a really stretched labor supply picture. But the point is that without suppliers, you can't build a plane. And not only that, but aircraft, I don't want to say they've all kind of come to be the same, but <laughs> in a lot of sectors that we cover, most of the progress, most of the technolo technological innovation is at the supplier level, not at the prime level. That certainly doesn't discount the great work that primes do, but so much of the performance improvement we've seen in all aerospace systems, civil, military, what have you, a lot of it comes at the supplier level. Yeah, you, you really, you know, are hitting the nail on the head with, you know, the airplane being the sum of the parts. And it's, of course, the, the primes get the big sticker on the side of the airplane that everybody thinks that everybody, everything is coming strictly from them. But you're, you're right. It, it's the suppliers that are bringing the innovation and, and all the wickets to bear for the primes to put together. And, and it really begs another question, especially if, you know, I'm going to lean into your experience here. Are suppliers defense specific or do you see a cross pollination between, you know, civil and defense aerospace? space applications and what about air versus space yeah you know well 
I'll deal with the civil military thing. I, I'm hard pressed to think of any suppliers that don't have exposure to both markets. And there's obviously just so much crossover. You know, well, well look at click bond. Passengers are needed for <laughs> everything. Yeah. But whether you build environmental control systems, auxiliary power units, or turbine engines, you're needed in both. Now, space is a bit of an outlier because space tends to be more of a boutique production and, of course, doesn't require a lot of the things needed. So I know plenty of suppliers who are not involved in the space market. But if you're in the uh, aircraft and other airborne systems market, almost certainly you're a supplier to to both civil and military. One real complication we're seeing, and we're learning all of these lessons, right, because it's been a long time since demand has been so much greater than supply, is that the military side of things tends to have different contract dynamics and, of course, profitability metrics and everything like that. So that balance within a supplier between what you prioritize, what you emphasize, can shift radically as a consequence of that. But in terms of exposure, for your question, yeah, it's it's everyone has exposure to both for the most part. Gotcha. And yeah, I really appreciate that. And you've mentioned the economy a few times. So I, I, now we're really picking into your expertise because not only are you an expert in this field, but you're an economist as well. So I want to get your take on how you rate the health of the sector and what are the key indicators that you're watching for? Well, you know, obviously a lot of it comes down to stock market performance and there have been a few stumbles, but for the most part, defense and aerospace companies have outperformed the broader economy, especially over the last, you know, 20 months or so since the Ukraine invasion began. In terms of profitability, it's challenged because, of course, you've got so many stumbles along the way, execution stumbles, and a part of it is new technology. You know, you look at Raytheon's geared turbofan on the commercial side, very promising, but not without major challenges that, and, and, and a lot of Wall Street investor sentiment revolves around perception of execution. How are you doing relative to your peers? So, so people can can stumble. Uh, it's not always rational, right? I mean, you look at the broader demand drivers and what should be a very, very favorable picture for aerospace and defense that, that doesn't always get factored in to investors who might be focused upon, you know, the next quarter and any hit to profitability that might take place as a result of execution challenges. But for the most part, here again, let's focus on the fundamental. The challenge is not attracting investor capital. It's ramping up. It's scaling up. It's building. And while there are worse problems to have, boy, from a managerial standpoint, it's, it's hard. Yeah. And we're going to talk more about scaling and those issues that I'm sure that you are all faced with on a daily basis. And, you know, I really want to bring Carl into the conversation as well and get your take from someone who's experiencing directly what Richard's describing. And how have you seen this play out in real life? Yeah, sure. It's like, and uh, of course, as always, uh, Richard has done a beautiful and eloquent job of painting the picture. And um, great job there, Richard, unpacking that dense question. So there's lots to respond to there. First off, it is really interesting to note the increase in the percentage of the value in the aircraft, whether it's on the defense side or the commercial side, that indeed resides now in the supply chain. And as a result, the tiers below the prime have a, a tremendous amount of responsibility. And certainly we see that and we're reminded of that all the time by our customers. You know, you do need indeed all the parts to fly the airplane. And we've seen over time what happens when all the parts, including fasteners, aren't ready to go. And I liken our job much to, to something much like the special effects industry in movie making. When we do our job well, no one notices. It's just a really awesome show. Uh, when you see a wire tying Superman to a crane, doesn't look so good. We have a tremendous amount of responsibility to do our part, and we're proud to do it well. And indeed, a lot of the innovation also goes to the supplier level. And, and that not only includes the product technologies themselves, but I think as we're going to talk about in this time together, the production innovation as well. And I think a lot of the unlock codes for how we scale and how we come back out of the COVID commercial downturn and address the really pressing geopolitical urgencies around defense is going to come to uh, some things that we'll talk about there around innovation around the production machine itself. And the suppliers have a tremendous uh, role to play there. I would like to believe 
that every key supplier in this supply chain has the sort of portfolio balance that Richard alluded to. I don't disagree that most have a balanced exposure or at least uh, some exposure to both defense and civil. I would condition that by saying some are more robust or more portfolio balanced than others. It's something personally that I have really strived for. And as I've grown up literally in, in our family business and have been doing this, as I say to my new employees, for either 25 years or 46 years, it just depends on when you start counting. I actually have lived this experience of watching times when there's a big up on, say, defense and commercial is down and vice versa, like in the early 90s. And it's only been in the recent history, of course, that we've had these episodes of double up. Uh, and that's the time that uh, everyone looks forward to. But I think that we are seeing examples of suppliers who have had far more exposure. And I'm going to say not necessarily to a sector, but the one that you really need to watch out for is to a program. So we have these signature programs, and we love them all, be it F-35 or be it F-16 or, or your favorite single aisle, okay? But if you build a bunch of capacity on the back of some uh, unique product serving a unique program, you've put yourself as a business at, at risk. And I would suggest finding your way out of that is not only healthy for you as a business, but really healthy for the supply chain broadly. So I would encourage everybody out there who's you know in a position to be out there winning business to recognize the peril of the upside in a certain way. When you catch a tiger by the tail and you've got something that's driving your business to grow, you immediately have to celebrate that and then look at the other side of the question, which is now, what am I going to use to balance that risk out? So that's a, a thought on that subject. And just you know, one other note here really about health in the supply base. This is really a place to put in a plug for the little guy, or at least the, the little model, whether, whether you're a small or a medium business. I genuinely believe that the aerospace and defense sector really favors the business model and the investment model of the private business, and maybe even the family-owned private business. And I'm not just saying that as a family-owned private business guy. Where I'm going is, this is a long cycle industry. And it's one where all benefit from the ability to make longer term investments. And we're going to talk about, I think, things like stability in the forecast and in, in the budgets on the defense side that are going to be very helpful here. But in general, because you can't count on certainty as much as you want it, the whole enterprise has benefited from those who have, you know, I like to call it patient capital and are willing to really invest, be it workforce, technology, capital, to really invest into the long term. And th to the extent that we have to approach it from a fickle standpoint of making the next quarter and meeting the analysts' expectations, boy, that just throws things really for a loop. So whether you have maybe a little bit more advantage in steering your own course from an investment standpoint, or at least from an investment philosophy standpoint, or you're fighting against some headwinds in that regard, I think anything we can do internally and in awareness in our industry, in our markets, in our investment community to support the realities of aerospace, which is a very long cycle investment, the better we'll all be off. Yeah, I could not agree more. One of the things that you mentioned was just the fact of having that patience game and, and understanding, you know, what just a long cycle that you're really signing up for here. And I really want to, you mentioned it, and I, I do want to dive into market stability and why it's important. You know, it's part of the challenge that we've discussed at Mitchell for years. There wasn't a lot of demand for, you know, military aircraft in the past 30 years, and now there's a surge. You know, we've seen orders fluctuate. You know, and that adds to the challenges for planning for the scale and scope of your workforce or your physical production space and long lead supplies and things like that. I mean, just look at uh, fiscal year 2023, where the budget request the DOD cut the F-35 request by about a third. And, you know, we were lucky that international orders plus some congressional ads filled that delta. But, you know, the point remains how important it is that the services Congress and our international partners help provide for a steady planning target for you. And we see this all the time, you know, government just seem to change their orders year to year. Yeah, I, I think that what you're hitting on here, Slick, is absolutely the thing. This is critical. So for any business, let alone one that has these certain uh, long period investments that I mentioned, stability and clarity end up being 
the, the, the rocket fuel to get to success. Needless to say, what we are experiencing right now and in recent years, uh, boy, I, maybe this is a, a statement of my youth. I can't really remember when it hasn't been this way, but the odyssey of continuing resolutions and constant second guessing and constant pushing it down the road puts on the supply base an incredible, an incredible burden to try to guess. And if we thought that whether you're a, you know, a supplier or a prime, if you thought that the investment decisions were challenging to make in general, now add to it this uncertainty about what we're really even, you know, where, where is the puck going? How do I even know where to skate to? Uh, and you have to make these very uh, significant investments in long-term uh, choices. So yes, yeah, stability is key here. And I do think as, uh, you know, F-35 is a beautiful example because it's an enormous program for us and one that we're very proud to, to be a key supplier to. But we need to, we need to see the confidence that comes. You know, everybody in the room knows that this is an important aircraft for the United States and for our allies for a very long, long time to come. There seems to be agreement around this. And now the aircraft is really hitting its marks and costs down and, and performance up, and, and we're moving down that road. So we all know that we need it. We all know that uh, I think most folks know that we want it. But how can we kind of now get to the place of committing to that and knowing where we have to go, let's just make it official and put some confidence behind that that, that folks can invest into. Uh, anything that we have to do to second guess this, okay, whether it's the F-35 or any program, as a supplier, as a prime, just adds cost. Why? Because either we haven't invested into regular order to sort of bridge that gap between what we want in Congress and what we need in business. If we can't invest into regular order and have rational, smooth increases in our capacity, time to execute our plans, the ability to do this in a stable way, you will inevitably be dealing with expedites and and hustle and waste and error and you know trying to, to second guess all of these all of these curves. So th the way to get costs down is to plan confidently and for the long term. And there's really no more potent thing for both availability of capability for the warfighter or for cost in value for cost down and value up for the taxpayer than frankly to clear the throat and make the commitment for stability in the demand for everybody involved. Yeah, I, I could not agree more having you know dealt with this in, in a previous life as well as a founder of a company uh, when you don't have that stability. Richard, I want to get you in on this question as well. How are you seeing things from your vantage point? Well, nothing but violent agreement, of course, with Carl. Very few companies have the advantage of patient capital, you know, <laughs> unfortunately. And in recent years, that balance for many of the publicly traded companies between civil and military has turned into a real disadvantage because of the terrible downturn we saw as a result of the COVID pandemic. And, and you couple that with exposure to certain programs, 737 in particular, which, which Carl mentioned, yeah, in terms of, you know, being overly vulnerable to one particular program, a great example, it's a real problem. It, it, debt or equity, both your ability to, to access both are negatively impacted to a huge degree. What is your best friend? Your best friend is a well-run program from the Pentagon with a great deal of confidence. And here's where we've had some issues with the F-35, because even though everyone wants one, because of that message being sent by Congress and by DOD that, that rather a long time it's taking to declare full rate production and then move on to the most valuable thing of all, which of course is multi-year procurement contracts, MYPs are hugely helpful. If you're a supplier that doesn't have the advantage of private capital, you know, you can take that literally to the bank <laughs> and say, look, five-year, four-year time horizon, they want X number, this is great. And of course, we also have international demand. And even though numbers on the F-35 are close to what they would be anyway because of production limits under full rate production, it's not the same as having that, that contractual guarantee, that clarity, that certainty that demand will be there. And here again, there's that dysfunction in Congress that Carl mentioned doesn't do us any favors at all. Because when you have programs that are ramping up, continuing resolution or some other form of budgetary paralysis sends a very negative signal. So uh, yes, absolutely. We need more clarity 
and we need more, you know, well, just arguments that suppliers, especially those lower in the tier level who might have otherwise had problems accessing capital can take to people who lend the money or invest in them and say, hey, we have this. This is why you should regard us as a safe bet. Sure. And building in that stability for a government contract when we're talking defense obviously has huge merits and efficiencies for you all as suppliers. And we did touch upon it earlier, but since you guys are affected in civil and military, you know, when we had COVID be so disruptive for the aerospace industry, we know that civil orders slowed tremendously, airliners were grounded, et cetera. You know, military lines seem to help keep the lights on for many firms. So Carl, how did COVID impact your business? Well, fortunately, I'm happy to say, first off, that we never had an operational shutdown. And I just will take the second to really appreciate the incredible job that our teams did in listening to the information we were able to uh, put together, took their responsibilities as part of that seriously, and stayed safe. And it really uh, is appreciated because we were able to keep our doors open, keep our uh, caseload very minimal, thankfully, and, and and keep working. But your question, of course, is really about you know the, the business environment. And I think it goes back to speaking to the way you framed the question about the importance of portfolio balance once again, because indeed we did see, not surprisingly, the commercial side of the business uh, go to ground in a disproportionate way to the, to the military side of the business. Interestingly enough, 2022 was our quote unquote COVID year which is interesting because I just, it really speaks to the market timing or the supply chain timing and a sense of what's out there in the pipeline and sort of where pockets of inventory are and and sometimes how they take time to burn down and how many different levels there can be in a supply chain that really decouple to, to just hit quickly another subject that decouple the knowledge of what to produce and when at the supplier OEM level from where the demand signal might be. And we're going to touch on that, I think, uh, in a bit. But that question of, you know, what, what really changes the game in terms of being efficient. So I think that the key thing that came to mind with this is that what the uh, federal government did and what the DOD did to enable our prime uh, customers in the defense programs to accelerate payment to the supply chain was really, really impactful. And, you know, we're grateful for that, to be able to see uh, not only the business and the demand remain perky in the defense side, but to also see that extra gesture of recognizing that accelerated cash flow to that supply base would potentially be make or break for some who were uh, particularly uh, inordinately burdened by the downturn in the commercial side. So I think that that's an example of government doing <laughs> doing a good thing, and, and, it, and it was much appreciated. I actually think, and, and I, I've said this in a few forums, I think the, the thing to pay attention to as much as we were concerned about where suppliers might fail on the way down, meaning as the commercial sector in particular drew down during and right after COVID, there wasn't as much supplier failure as I guess I might have thought. And Richard, I'll be interested in your thoughts on this. But where the concern is, is as we now go up the backside, who is going to be able to or is going to be interested in participating in the upside. You know, this all came at an interesting time, which is, you know, generationally, we have a lot of family businesses where folks uh, had to make a decision, you know, are we going to push the chips back in again? Or maybe is it time to to call it a day? Because the ramp back up, uh, you know, requires so much in terms of of capital investment that you may have uh, sloughed off capacity to maybe make ends meet during the downturn. You've laid off talent. How do we get it back? Can we get it back, whether it's at company X or whether it's even in the sector? And so I think there are going to be a lot of challenges with the ramp back up, as excited as we all are to see it. I think that there may be actually more departures or, or ricketiness that's seen on the way up than there was even on the way down. Yeah, that that's an incredible perspective. And you're right. I mean, that is the challenge, the, the ramp up piece. And that's a lot of the unforeseen issues that came out of COVID and all of this really insightful. And I appreciate that. And Richard, I, I want to ask how 
you look at this period of history, you know, the, the slowdown and airline orders allowed, you know, some firms to double down on their military order uh, book. But now that, you know, both are strong, things are just tight, essentially given a, a dual surge, if you will. Yeah, I cannot agree more with Carl. It's, it's absolutely essential to understand a bit of history here. You know, you had this period of time over the last decade where suppliers were viewed as a fantastic opportunity for a margin grab by the primes, particularly in the commercial world, particularly Boeing with partnering for success and other initiatives designed to, to grab profit. They survived that. And this is a point made by my co-manager director, Kevin Michaels. He authored a wonderful piece talking about the sort of evolution of pain. Anyway, then came the 737 MAX shutdown, and then came COVID-19. Suppliers have been through the ringer. And as Carl said, I would have thought that a lot of the supply chain would be uh, a radioactive cindering heap coming out of but, uh, the pandemic. But they, they did everything they could to survive. That meant laying off people. That meant building up lots of debt, meant selling, selling anything that could be sold. They survived. And now, as he says, on the upside, this is going to be challenging. Getting those people back, dealing with that debt burden, all of those things are major challenges for the supply chain. And that's why the ramp is going to be a lot more challenging than, in some ways than, than the downturn. Um, I tend to think we'll come through. That is to say, <laughs> we'll, you know, find a way because frankly, the the opportunities are, are there. I sort of have the, the hope that one day, maybe there'll be a bit of slack in other parts of the economy and people will say, well, there's always aerospace that's more resilient and they'll be able to prioritize capital and labor and whatever else for our, our beloved industry. Nevertheless, this is an unusual problem to be having, accessing the resources needed to make the ramp. Well, gentlemen, we've we've really talked about the hit that COVID-19 has, has had on, on the industry and, and, of course, the human capital side of, of the house, which will always be a, a challenge. But I, I really want to focus for a minute here on materials because, you know, in preparing for this episode, a lot of the experts that we reached out to highlight the challenges, they're seeing securing enough raw materials to keep up with demand in certain areas as, as one of the long poles in the tent. So obviously ties to supply chains factor everyday Americans. We're seeing this in our lives everywhere that we turn. So can you provide us some thoughts specifically how this affects you all? And we'll get started with Carl and then go Richard. Okay. So the raw material question is a real one. And I'll just sort of use an example from our neck of the woods in particular, A286 high nickel stainless steel is the bread and butter material that most aerospace fasteners and, and other mechanical hardware rely on in whatever form it may come, bar, wire, strip. And uh, there are only a couple of mills globally that are accessible for a uh, manufacturer of this product particularly if you're doing that in a U.S. defense context under the DFARS. So the uh, acute supply or, or shortage of supply of materials uh, is very, very real. And that's just using one example there. I think that it's going to be a reality that the only long-term solution for is increased capacity. And in some of these cases, those are billion-dollar investments on somebody's part to make that happen. And it ties to a bunch of you know, other incentivization and regulatory relief to even make that capacity available. And that's if you start planning to build it now, and then you might have it in the, you know, the better part of a decade. In the short term, it's going to really require efficient utilization of the not only talents, as we talked about before, which is a shortage, but now materials that are going to be available to us as a supply chain and as an industry. So, for example, as the uh, commercial side of the the house comes rocketing back with confidence. And we're seeing single aisle production that both Boeing and, and Airbus, you know, heading back into, well, heading past where it was and into the 70s a month. This is an example of getting on the game and getting on the stick. Now, what's happening, unfortunately, on the defense side is, we talked about a little earlier, that uncertainty and that lack of conviction and clarity, and I'm warning our, our defense programs about this, is putting them at the back of the line. And that's a really unfortunate thing because you've got all of this confidence pushing in subscribing material that is, you know, it is a, it is a non-growing pie and the bigger wedge is being taken by those who can act first. 
And that seems to be the commercial sector right now. And it does give me concern as to where we're going to be in terms of availability to support not only the programs that are in action right now, but all of the incredible capability from you know, Gen 6 to CCAs to, to all of the, the great product that we're going to need to uh, protect ourselves for the next decades. I'm not exactly sure where the material is going to come from if we can't get clearer signals. And we're going to need to use, as I say, better information throughout the supply chain to allocate what we have most efficiently. Richard, did you have any thoughts on that one? Oh, absolutely. You know, I mean, it's clearly a key limiting factor, as Carl says, right after labor and maybe right with labor. And there are big changes coming in engineered materials, but also raw material requirements. But don't neglect the geopolitical perspective on this. You know, you look at a lot of rare earths, a lot comes from China. You look at a lot of titanium, both the sponge, raw material, titanium, and the milled product. Uh, a lot of that comes from <laughs> Russia and other dangerous neighborhood countries. This is all a big challenge. And I, I sometimes think that, per Carl's comment, that yes, more is needed, big investments in capacity to produce more of this, that maybe we need some kind of public-private partnership here because you know, I think the reason you might not invest in, say, additional milled capacity for titanium is that you're afraid Russia will come back online and they'll undercut you and destroy your investments because you won't ever amortize what is effectively a very capital-intensive decision. Maybe the way forward is to simply say, okay, private sector working with government works to guarantee X years of purchase of this of product from this new investment at X price, thereby guaranteeing that it will be paid back uh, with, with the rationale that it's national security. Basically, we shouldn't be so dependent upon these dangerous providers of important material. So I, I think some innovative thinking is definitely required here to increase the industrial bandwidth that's so dependent upon not just exotic, but well, all kinds of materials that'll be needed to execute on new generation programs. Yeah, I mean, that makes a ton of sense. And of all the things that we've talked about, the types of money, the speed and cost of money and the stability there, th this is probably one of the most game changing thoughts that we've chatted about so far. I mean, really to bring in long-term stability into the market. And I know our audience can't see you teeing up this question, and I'm not asking from the perspective that you all have a lot of gray hairs because you don't. But, you know, we have learned some lessons and thinking back to the 80s, really the last large tranche of major production that we saw in the you know, defense sector with the Reagan buildup of the 80s. So clearly we've been in this type of challenge before. Why did it work then? Well, from my perspective, part of it is that, frankly, there was still an industrial base size for the Cold War. People say there was a Reagan buildup, and there was, but it began under Carter, really. And even before that, it was only a couple of years between the end of the big Vietnam ramp up. So really, if, if there was a bit of sluggishness in the mid-70s, it wasn't nearly as pronounced as what the industry went through in the 90s and 2000s. It was also pretty much the, the sort of buildup that had a lot in common <laughs> with everything that came before. We talk about getting to 156 F-35s per year. In 1967, McDonnell Aircraft reached 72 F-4s per month. I mean, it gives you an idea of how the industrial base was sized. There were eight or 10 defense contractors that were perfectly capable of building combat aircraft in the 80s during that Reagan buildup. Today, there are three. We might be heading to two. We don't know. And it was just a completely different set of circumstances. Here, we've really had 25, 30 years of softness and restructuring, both at the prime and the supplier level. Even worse in Europe, one of the sort of untold stories, another big change is that you've had a bit of a bit of traction among emerging producers in Asia, Turkey, Taiwan, whoever else, Australia, certainly. And thank God for that, because it's introducing industrial capacity, say for ammunition, artillery shells, things like that, exactly when we need it. If we didn't have that, we would have had this industrial that we would depend upon this industrial base that was geared for, well, the 90s and 2000s, which was going to take you back to FY 1999. The procurement budget, I believe, was $38 billion that year. 
this year, of course, we are uh, ramping up to 170 billion. That gives you an idea of just how the industrial base was scaled back then compared to now. Yeah, that's absolutely a fascinating point. Looking back at history, really interesting to see where we've gone. And it now causes me to think about, and we've mentioned a few things here about future technologies and things like that, but it makes me think about in your industries, how to build the next generation of capability and capacity and what innovation looks like at the supplier level. I really would like for you both to talk about how this works, because do you respond to requirements issued by the primes or is there a bottom-up approach or pushing, you know, for product improvement? And how does investing funding work, you know, to empower this type of innovation at your level? Well, I can certainly uh, hit that one, Slick, because this is near and dear to my heart. While, yes, nominally, ClickBond is a, quote, fastener company, what we really have been for the last 35 years is, is an assembly technology company. And in fact, the engineered solutions that we produce largely in conjunction with a deep understanding of our customers' needs, where they're heading, and where their economic pressures and technical pressures and challenges reside, has really shaped what we do. So, so we have, you know, on every day are actually at the front line of how do you make one of these high-performance platforms cheaper to produce, more flexible and capable in its, in its design, and, and easier to maintain over a longer life cycle. And a lot of that you know, speaks to innovation coming from the supplier level, from a technology and product standpoint. And so I think that the extent to which we can have the prime customer base put in parallel with its acknowledgement of the incredible percentage of the value that comes from the supply chain, continuing to lean into collaboration and tapping of the supply chain for concepts to bring innovative suppliers into the conversation earlier. As I always like to say, we can do our best damage if we get there early and really be of greatest value and, and help. And I think that there's a tremendous amount of talent across not only this national, but as Richard reminds us, now this global partner supply chain. It's not just that we have prime level uh, capacity around the world in the allied space. We have great sub-tier capability to draw upon as well. And that's at both the production and the engineering level. But at the production side, which is a key piece of your question, at least at ClickBond, our mantra is this. We have to earn our way onto the program every single day. So we're not waiting to be told, hey, you got to spiff up the value proposition here. We get it. And that's really what we're driving to do within our, not only our product technology and offering new ideas. Hey, you know, if we make this tweak, I think we can deliver uh, an answer here and try to anticipate those things and be useful. But in the actual production and execution of the book of business that we've been lucky to earn, we're constantly looking at proactive ways to drive improvement there. And I would suggest that the supply base should be trusted a little bit more in that regard, if I may say so. There seems to be a general tone of like, watch out for industry or else they'll take too big of a slice for themselves. I really don't think that that is the attitude. And I think the more that we can, especially on our defense programs, lean into the supply base as a loyal, invested, trusted partner and have transparent conversations about where things are going and where their challenges is going to be the best way to unlock the capability and the genuine patriotism and passion of our supply base to support the warfighter. Awesome. Richard, anything to add on that one? Well, you know, here, again, you see the advantage of patient capital <laughs> because I think for a lot of suppliers, even though I'm sure their their heart is in it from a patriotic standpoint, sometimes there are limits to what they can invest by way of independent research and development because of investors, particularly not to single out activist investors, but, you know, there is the broader dynamic of investor concerns and the need to say, here's the business case for investing in this new technology, and it's got to be ironclad, right? And that's why IRAD as a percent of revenue has been, well, steadily declining in the defense industry for some time. But yeah, the better run companies will indeed identify opportunities for improving the technology they offer, both in terms of rejuvenating existing platforms and, of course, securing positions on new platforms. And, and again, the system still works well enough that we can say with confidence that an awful lot of the innovation that you see in defense does indeed come from suppliers. And Richard's point is well taken. I do not want to sound Pollyanna here about that reality because the investment has to come from the supply base itself. And that IRAD 
conviction is hard to make in any investment concept, public, private, PE, family, whatever it may be, if you don't have that confidence in where we're going. And so that brings us back to that sort of clarity and stability we spoke of earlier. Uh, Just to sort of quickly follow on to that, I think we're all haunted. Those of us who have those gray hairs, we remember the late 80s and early 90s, and you look at what's driving this tremendous uptick in defense spending right now, it could go away. And I won't be crying if peace breaks out. (laughs) I'll be a very happy man. But on the other hand, from an investment standpoint, you have to be mindful that if you don't have some clarity on requirements, there is the possibility that somehow the strategic situation completely changes, the rug is pulled out from under you, and everything you've done comes to naught. Yeah, well, Richard, you couldn't have teed me up to my next follow-up question any better than that, because, you know, as we often say, the enemy has a vote, and we're finding ourselves in a time of renewed peer competition. I would argue, you know, one from a technological standpoint that we haven't seen before, look at the likes of China, Russia, and what's going on in North Korea and Iran. So obviously, we just can't continue to churn out existing designs. And he had mentioned, you know, I'm thinking about if you're a young engineer, any of these supply companies would be the really exciting places to go. Because when we think about things like CCAs or new UAV classes and things like that, obviously, you guys are on the leading edge, but it's it's a tough place to be because you don't know if you're going to invest a bunch of time in innovation that will then go to a prime contract or something like that. So could you quickly touch on that? Because I know that we are getting tight on time, but I really want to understand, especially for for those that are seeking to enter the aerospace market, you know, it seems like one of your companies would be the way to go. Sure. So, you know, as we look at how to make those investments, there's some things that Look, I I don't think that we are actually ready, and it may not to take Richard's traditional position as the pessimist, but we are not ready. We are not ready as a U.S. supply base to face the outbreak of any one or more of the major scenarios that, especially in combination, uh, we could be unfortunately facing uh, over the coming decade. And yeah, I would love for peace to break out as well, but we need to be prepared. And so there are some things that, you know, when we talk about that innovation and simply being ready to deliver against the needs, it's going to take investment. And that investment kind of needed to start yesterday. What do we need to do, or at least what should we not do to discourage such investment. One of them I got to pick on here is the treatment of of R&D investment from a tax standpoint and an expensing standpoint right now. So as if it wasn't bad enough to cripple industry by, you know, not renewing the R&D tax credit, we now have this R&D amortization concept that is further disincentivizing these investments at exactly the time in the history of the sector, as we've been talking about, where we need to make an increased investment, not only in technology innovation, you know, the R&D you tend to think of, but production innovation as well. We have limited materials. We have limited workforce. So what do we have to do? We have to invest in the techniques, the production capabilities, the automation, the material science, the on and on, information technology, operational technology, the 4.0, uh, manufacturing 4.0 things, to be able to wring out every bit of capability from the resources, workforce, CapEx, materials that we have. And this is exactly the wrong time to be setting up the paradigms that we have right now. Oh, by the way, especially against the backdrop of the geopolitical situation, this is an area where we've got to really get it right. When we talk about where the United States and its allies have advantages and you want to keep this sustainable overmatch uh, with our near peers. Part we cannot forget about is the procurement system itself, the economic environment and industrial atmosphere itself, and the ability to actually invest into the production capabilities needed to deliver the exquisite or simply the the throw weight of technology that, that we're going to need to indeed have that confidence. You know, from my standpoint, well, I've never had the pleasure and challenges of running a company myself. I can tell you, just looking at history, that's certainly borne out. A friend of mine who was a defense contracts attorney used to say that defense contract attorneys won World War II. And, of course, he meant that uh, semi-jocularly. But when I challenged him on the rational underpinnings for it, he said, very simple, a lot of the weapons improvement that took place in a real-time basis during World War II was enabled or accelerated 
by contract terms that allowed for this sort of thing to happen and be reimbursed in real time. Companies would make investments in, in design changes and whatever else and were guaranteed it wouldn't uh, put a crimp in production and uh, they wouldn't have to be uh, you know, requalified or whatever. It would simply go straight ahead. You just, you know, when you read books like Arthur Herman's Freedom's Forge and all the others that are that such fascinating contributions to the literature of what happened during that tremendous challenge, which we could be seeing an echo of today, it really does come down to, as Carl says, the contracting environment and the terms and conditions that govern the operations of our defense industrial base. Yeah, absolutely. And, and gentlemen, looking at the clock here, we are super tight on time, but I want to get this question in the mix for a good parting shot from each of you. So how do we ensure we have secure and, and robust supplier base for the long term? And just wrapping it up, you know, what can Congress do? What can the services do? What can the primes do and, and the public at large do to, to really ensure this? Well, I'll give it a first shot, if you don't mind. Yeah, please do. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I think the first and foremost thing is to just maintain an awareness that there is more to war fighting than simply maintaining troops in place and, and equipment in the field. A lot of it does come down to the technology innovation and wartime replenishment capabilities needed from the defense industrial base. And when time, just like you can't neglect your military, when when times suddenly turn peaceful, you can't neglect your defense industrial base either. It needs to be, you know, calculated. And it's sort of interesting right now in Washington, let's put on my resident Washingtonian hat here, there seems to be both on both sides of the house a, a remarkable turn in favor of industrial policy with the broader economy. Yet that doesn't seem to have quite trickled down to the defense side of things. And I'd like to see more of that mindfulness of what can be done, public-private partnerships that encourage uh, everything from the sort of contracting changes that Carl talks about to the sort of public-private partnerships on the material side to allow for an adequate supply of materials that are threatened by geopolitical realities to uh, workforce training and other similar programs designed to maintain an adequate supply of trained technical labor, it needs to be out there in the public view and considered by Congress in their defense budgeting and, and, and whatever else. So from my side, to hit them fast, stability in the demand signal and confidence and commitment that can inspire investment from the supply base. We need that from government. We need to have a regulatory environment that doesn't disincentivize investment, uh, such as the R&D scenario. We also need to have a sensible permitting environment as we look at how to develop energy sources that uh, are going to fuel all of this securely and uh, economically and ecologically for the future. From the primes, I really think that uh, I'll reiterate, get the suppliers in early. Why? Not only because we can be of most assistance in uh, affecting the designs to the positive, but also we can share the knowledge of what's being demanded across multiple programs and multiple sectors. So we can de-risk for the supply chain and de-cost for the warfighter things that might otherwise get designed in some exquisite way, when in fact there's kind of a cost solution that could be offered if, if we were just asked. And I would say for parents and the public, even beyond aerospace and defense, it is reestablishing the nobility of careers in manufacturing in this country and really building. I think we're on the way to doing that, which is really awesome. But a, a recognition that whether it's in aerospace, which is, of course, my favorite part of manufacturing, uh, or in our manufacturing uh, trades broadly, these are fantastic, good paying jobs that are opportunities to build skills and modern manufacturing in the United States is just an amazing thing. And the more that we can uh, expose parents to that and uh, use that as part of the equation alongside our teachers and our educational system, uh, and, and that's particularly at the vocational and the, the community college level, there's just an awesome ability to build skills in this country that are going to be extraordinarily useful both in times of distress and, and in times of peace. And, you know, that's always been a cornerstone of American economic success and societal success is we've been the makers and the doers and the innovators. And so I think there's a lot we can do to not only solve the problems of our aerospace and defense sector, but just continue to make uh, American manufacturing innovation great. 
Yeah, I, I could not agree more there. I mean, what a great way to uh, wrap this episode up. And like I mentioned, the exciting part for me was thinking about if you're a young engineer or, or somebody who is interested in manufacturing, this is this is the place to go in the fields that you all are in. And it's just super exciting. And, and it really just drives it at home. The old saying of, you know, it's all about ball bearings, right? So at the end of the day, it's the individual components that really matter. And going back to what Richard said in the beginning, it's all the parts to the airplane that, that really matter. So I cannot say thank you to both of you enough for spending your time with us today on the Aerospace Advantage. And just thank you so much for being here. Been, uh, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for the opportunity. Good to be with you, Slick, Richard. Yeah, it's really been great to be on. Thanks, Carl. Thanks, Slick. Enjoyed it a lot. With that, I'd like to extend a big thank you to our guests for joining in today's discussion. I'd also like to extend a big thank you to our listeners for your continued support and for tuning in to today's show. If you like what you've heard today, don't forget to hit that like button and follow or subscribe to the Aerospace Advantage. You can also leave a comment to let us know what you think about our show or areas you think we should explore further. As always, you can join in on the conversation by following the Mitchell Institute on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or LinkedIn, and you can always find us at mitchellaerospacepower.org. Thanks again for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Stay safe and check six.